you know, there's so little that we really know about Bach's life. It's, it's, it's really rather pathetic. It's almost as if there's a kind of omerta that's preventing us as his l deep followers and, and uh, lovers of his music from knowing the truth about him. He, he was a very private person and only really his children and his wives knew really about him, one suspects. And he handed a version down to his children that was heavily edited. And um, one feels that uh, the spin doctors in the Bach family made sure that only certain things were delivered. And so, uh, yes, there's this correspondence between um, Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach and um, uh, Johann F uh, Nicolas Forkel, Bach's first biography. But even that is limited, limited in what it has to tell us. It's as though we're trying to reconstruct um, a statue of the person Bach, and we only have shards of evidence that are sitting in a pile at the foot of the statuary, and gradually we can piece things together. And all the work that, that's being done in the Bach Archive gives us just the chance of piecing together an arm, a leg, a neck, a head. So eventually we'll get more, and I'm enormously in awe and full of admiration for the work that's being done there because they're helping us enormously to to correct um, this skewed image that uh, has been inherited from the earliest biographers and and then all through the 19th century the the, the idea that uh, that Bach was the fifth evangelist that he was this perfect human being um, perfect like his music Bach was by far from being a perfect individual. The really great thing about the Bach Archive in Leipzig and its amazing team of uh, researchers led by its director, Dr. Peter Volney, is the wonderful ability that they have shown to identify and to pick out and select documents that otherwise would have gone missing that uh, reveal other fragments of Bach's life. I mean, one thinks particularly of the discovery in the um, Amalia Bibliothek in, in Weimar in the last few years, particularly of the transcriptions of organ tablature of Bach when he was um, a teenager. Um, and it fills in the gaps in our knowledge of his life um, and also not just of his life but also of his competence and his skills in so many areas suddenly we are aware that he learned so much more from his elder brother Johann Christoph Bach in Ordruf and was able to play much more as a, already as a virtuoso organist than we had previously believed and then it, it, it confirms for example that he did indeed study with Georg Böhm in Lüneburg when his voice broke and uh, that he was deeply influenced by Böhm and through him had access to the North German school of organ composition, which his brother, Johann Christoph, didn't have. And then the two of them were able to bring, to pool their resources and to bring um, their knowledge, uh, Johann Sebastian of the North German tradition and Johann Christoph of his uh, work with Pachelbel together. Uh, it's, it's part of the whole family business. And that's really fascinating that, that we're beginning to realize or to have concrete evidence of the interchanges between the brothers and between the whole Bach family. The great thing about Bach's manuscripts and his autograph is that it tells us so much more than just the bleak information about the notes themselves. It tells us a lot about his own performance practice. It's written into the score, it's written into the parts, particularly the parts that uh, he's revised and uh, improved upon when he's uh, bringing back a piece, a cantata, uh, after several years and he's been thinking about it and he wants to add a different layer of performance on top of it. It's fascinating. Also, the way that 
the gestures of his music are reproduced by his own handwriting is a huge help to the performer. Uh, you can have a computerized, perfect, printed version, word text version of the score, and that's wonderful. But it's even better to have a facsimile, or at least access to a facsimile, of his own writing, because one can learn so much from the phrasing, from the, the spacing of the notes, from the, the gestures of the music. Well, it would be so wonderful to be able to talk to people who, by some miracle, who had uh, worked with Bach and who had uh, performed under his direction. And we have, of course, the, direct, the famous description of him uh, um, conducting uh, by uh, Gesner. But uh, one would love so much to know exactly what he did. What did he do with his continuo? You know, what was his real ideal practice, for instance, in the cantatas and in the passions, in the uh, arrangement of the continuous section, um, the length of the notes they played, the distribution between harpsichord and organ, when was one tacit, when was not tacit, the use of a 16-foot uh, double bass, um, the, the use of fagotto or basson and, and how he varied it, and how his performance practice changed from his early years in Arnstadt and Mühlhausen to his time in Weimar when he was working in the, uh, in the Himmelsburg Kapelle uh, to at the time in Leipzig. And even in Leipzig, how his, his, his performance tradition changed um, in the course of his years. I mean, after the time when he almost gave up writing cantatas and went more towards secular music, uh, performed in in Zimmermann's Café and so on, um, then went back again to, to performing cantatas. The fascinating things that, that he altered in terms of instrumentation, in terms of adding on ornamentation. I mean, all of this is, is beginning to be uncovered thanks to the eagle eye of, of uh, um, people like uh, Peter Volney uh, and the other scholars who are working there in the Bach Archiv. There's more to be discovered. But my gosh, there's so much more we would love to, to, to understand and to, to be confirmed in our beliefs. And one, I think one has to conclude that all theories, however radical and however fascinating they are in themselves, need qualifying by the statement we just don't know fully. We, we know a certain amount, we don't know fully. But I'm optimistic. I think that in the next few years, provided the funding for the Bach Archive is uh, really reinforced and augmented um, with the scholars that are there and maybe more that are coming into it and the contacts that these scholars have with other um, centers of scholarship, that our whole picture of Bach will develop, go on developing, and be enriched. And that's the most we can ask for. If we really want to get close to the person, the character, and the, the figure of Bach the man, as well as Bach the composer, I think there are two works that stand out. Uh, the first one is obvious, really. It's the Matthäus Passion, and I think one, to that one ha has to add also the the Hamel Messer, the B minor Mass. Uh, particularly in the B minor Mass, the transition in the Confiteo, in the Credo, from that to the Et Expecto, because Bach lets down his defenses in the extraordinary passage that slows the music down because in the opening confiteo it's such a statement of conviction and of no doubts at all it's a big ex cathedra statement i believe in the resurrection confiteo unum baptisma in remissionem peccatorum and then suddenly the whole edifice of the music crumbles and we're into a sort of no man's land of of shady and uncertain music making and one senses that Bach's own faith is being put to the ultimate test um, and that he shares or he is sharing with us 
his doubts and our doubts and showing that it's all right, it's okay to have doubts um, and that I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come is to start with a, un, an uncertain route and you're led through all these impossible harmonies and enharmonic changes and then suddenly it returns to where it, from which it began, the place from which it started, and it explodes into life for the et expecto resurrectum mortuorum. And suddenly one knows that there is certainty in the resurrection, and Bach has shown us his own faith. That's, that's one example. I mean, there are others in the Matthäus Passion I could uh, uh, refer to, but I would say Cantata 20, or Ewigkeit to Donnerwort, which is the opening cantata of his second cycle, is very revealing about Bach the man and Bach the thinker and believer. Because in that piece, he postulates such a, a, a terrifying picture of Armageddon, of uh, whatever happens when the whole world is going to crumble. And also, he establishes the uncertainty of death when it will arrive. I mean, there's extraordinary um, uh, alto solo and then the tenor duet, duet or mention kind, um, where you sense that uh, life's uncertainty um, and when life will come to an end is brought right into the present tense. We don't know when the zag, when the coffin is going to arrive. <laughs> 